Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly with open arms. The Holy Father arrives in Mongolia greeted by children. We're on the ground in the East Asian nation. Back and forth. The White House says the economy is improving, but not everyone agrees. We have the latest. Persecuting pro-lifers. Why one D.C. writer says that he will never vote for President Joe Biden. And on the margins, Pope Francis releases his prayer intention for the month of September. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us tonight. Our top story, Pope Francis made history today as he arrived in the capital of Mongolia. He is the first pope to ever step foot in the East Asian nation, home to roughly just 1,500 Catholics. The Holy Father was greeted by children as he arrived at his residence. He will stay in the country until September 4th. The official events begin tomorrow morning. EWTN Vatican News correspondent Colin Flynn is on the ground in Mongolia and has this report. A very good evening, Tracy, from Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, where Pope Francis touched down this morning, making history by being the first pope ever to set foot in this nation. He was greeted by the country's foreign minister and then presented by a woman in traditional dress. Some boiled and dried yogurt made out of cows and camel's milk, which is symbolic of the traditional nomadic life that many people live here in Mongolia. After that, there was a small low-key welcoming celebration for the Pope at the airport. Remember, not many people in attendance. The Catholic population here is very small, only 1,400 people. But Tracy, what made news today was not what happened on the ground here in Mongolia, but more what happened in the air as Pope Francis made that 10-hour journey overnight from Rome to Ulaanbaatar because his plane passed through Chinese airspace. Now, this is hugely significant when you think of the history of papal journeys and popes famously Pope John Paul II, being refused permission to enter Chinese airspace. But on this occasion, Beijing allowed it. They permitted it. And you even think of the recent heightening of tensions between the Holy See and China over the controversial China-Vatican deal, when recently the people, People's Republic of China blatantly violating the deal by appointing bishops without the consent or even knowledge of the Vatican. So tensions have been at an all-time high between the Vatican and China. So this is seen as a good step in diplomacy between the two. And as is a common Vatican protocol, the Pope took this opportunity in the dead of night to send a telegram from the plane to the president of China, Xi Jinping. And in that telegram, he expressed greetings and good wishes to Your Excellency and the people of China. He said, I'm assuring you of my prayers for the well-being of the nation. I evoke upon all of you the divine blessing of unity and peace. And incredibly, Tracy, the foreign minister of China responded to that today, saying that it showed friendliness and goodwill. And they went on to say that China is willing to continue to walk in the same direction as the Vatican. But keep in mind, at the same time, China also refused permission for the Catholic bishops in China and Catholic faithful uh, permission to travel here to Mongolia for this papal trip to meet the Holy Father and celebrate the first time that he will ever be here in Mongolia. They were not permitted to leave mainland China for this. Over the next few days, the Pope will have a busy schedule. Tomorrow he is meeting some of the priests, nuns and religious missionaries here in this country, only 80 in total. And then on Sunday, he will have an inter-religious meeting with some of the heads of other religions here in the country. Buddhism, of course, accounting for 52% of the population. And then on Sunday evening, he will celebrate Mass in the Steppe Arena with what is expected to be still a modest crowd when you compare it to crowds we see in previous papal journeys. But for just now, that is the update from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. This is Colm Flynn for EWTN News Nightly. Well, back here in the United States, one person has been arrested after a fire destroyed a historic church in Oregon. The pastor of St. Joseph Catholic Church in Salem, Oregon, says the sanctuary is, quote, pretty much a loss. No one was injured in the blaze. Police say they have arrested a 48-year-old man in the suspected arson. 
He remains in custody. A former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick found not competent earlier this week to stand trial on sexual abuse charges says he has trouble remembering words. In a recent psychological evaluation, the 93-year-old said that he could not remember words like trial or pacemaker, adding he also could not name the current president of the United States. Earlier this week, a judge in Massachusetts dismissed criminal abuses charges against McCarrick. The former cardinal was laicized in 2019, following credible allegations of abuse against adults and children. Now, president Joe Biden speaks from the Rose Garden this morning. The subject, the latest jobs report. The nation's employers added 187,000 jobs in August, but as Americans are stung by inflation, the White House is looking at every opportunity to convince people that things are improving, despite plenty of pushback from those who say the economy isn't getting any better. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Tracy, President Joe Biden delivered his remarks this afternoon here at the White House. And as the Labor Day weekend kicks off, the labor market remains resilient. In the jobs report, a sign the pace of hiring may be cooling. The Fed's ultimate goal, getting inflation under control. As the job market still healthy shows signs of cooling, President Joe Biden tells Americans. Take note of the fact that America is now one of the strongest job creating periods in our history, in the history of our country. The president, seeking another term in office, believes his administration's efforts to bring inflation down are working. Inflation continues to fall. It's now around 3 percent, about one third of what it was one year ago. The jobs report also showed the unemployment rate rose, but still low by historical standards. The report also comes as gas prices average 3.81 a gallon. Mortgage rates are in the 7% neighborhood, and buying food at the grocery store is taking more out of wallets. On Twitter, the GOP tweeting out the last three months, June, July, August, have been the worst three-month stretch for job growth since the pandemic. And in another tweet, gas prices are at historic highs heading into Labor Day weekend. Under Biden, they've been high for years. Meanwhile, Idalia, the storm's path of destruction through four states, has left behind shattered towns and shocked residents. Idalia first hit Florida as a hurricane and then moved on to spark flooding in Georgia and South Carolina and heavy rains in North Carolina. President Biden will visit Florida tomorrow. And as he does, the White House says it needs $4 billion more to address natural disasters. That up from the initially requested $12 billion. The Federal Emergency Management Agency's Disaster Relief Fund helps with rescue and relief efforts. But the supplemental funding request first needs to be approved by lawmakers. Now back to President Biden's speech in the Rose Garden this afternoon. When he was done speaking, reporters, including myself, right away fired off questions at him, but he just turned his back and walked away. He did answer one question when a reporter asked whether he'd be meeting with Governor DeSantis of Florida tomorrow, in which he replied, yes. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Now, three Republican lawmakers made a quick trip into northwest Syria this past weekend. It is the first known visit to the war-torn country by American lawmakers in six years. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with more on their mission and reaction to what they saw. Eric. Good evening, Tracy. You know, the three congressmen, French Hill of Arkansas, Ben Klein of Virginia, and Scott Fitzgerald of Wisconsin, entered Syria through Turkey. I did speak with Congressman French Hill by phone, and he tells me that he hopes that their visit will urge the Biden administration to do more to pressure Syrian President Bashar Assad to adopt political reform. Well, for 12 years, we've witnessed uh, just the extraordinary atrocities of the Assad regime against his own people. Uh, with his co-conspirators, Russia and Iran. The roughly one-hour stop signaled significant support on Capitol Hill for the opposition in Syria's long civil war. Congressman Hill tells me in his home city of Little Rock, Arkansas, there is an effective humanitarian operation to help the Syrian people, known as the Syrian Emergency Task Force, or SETF. And the SETF is very active in northwest Syria, providing aid and comfort to all the families whose, whose lives have been upended by Assad. 
The Syrian conflict began in 2011 after Bashar Assad, president of Syria, launched a campaign to crush what began as a peaceful uprising against his family's autocratic rule. The conflict has splintered the country and killed at least 300,000 civilians. Many Arab leaders are now breaking from the U.S., which stands with the United Nations in condemning the use of chemical weapons against Syrian civilians. During the trip, lawmakers visited orphans. It's disturbing to see these beautiful uh, with, in their school uniforms, young girls holding up, and young boys holding up uh, photos of their dads who were killed by Assad. Congressman Hill, a devout Catholic, tells me that he was overwhelmed with feelings of grief for those families and frustration that the international community can't come together and find a political solution to a war that's now going into its 12th year. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including Eye on the Election. A DC opinion writer says the Biden administration is persecuting pro-lifers. And as Pope Francis arrives in Mongolia, we examine the country's long history of freedom of worship. Pennsylvania plans to end a 30-year contract with Real Alternatives, a pro-life pregnancy support center. Democrat Governor Josh Shapiro said that he is steadfast in defending abortion access. The pro-life contract will end on December 31st. In the past, the group had provided state and federal funds to several groups, including Catholic charities. Well, in an opinion piece earlier this week, one D.C. writer says that he will never vote for Joe Biden because the president is persecuting pro-lifers. Writing in the Washington Examiner, Timothy P. Carney says, in part, quote, Biden has made it clear that he doesn't merely disagree with pro-lifers, but that he hates us and wants to sick the federal government on us. Carney also points to the Department of Justice bringing charges against pro-lifer Mark Houck. He was arrested after allegedly blocking access to an abortion business. Carney notes the pro-lifer was actually arrested for responding to provocation from a pro-abortion activist who had shunned his son and mocked, quote, pedophile priests. Now, the author of that piece joins us now. Timothy B. Carney is a senior columnist for The Washington Examiner and a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Tim, welcome back. Great to see you again. Uh, in Thank your you column, you talk about President Biden, and you note several Republicans have said they cannot, in good faith, vote for Donald Trump if he's the party's nominee in 2024. Tim, talk to us more about that. And also curious, I mean, did you write this piece, at least partially for them? Yeah, so I often criticize Donald Trump for the things he did, uh, especially at the end of his first term uh, regarding the, the 2020 election, where he lost and he refused to accept. And when I comment online that that I really don't want to vote for Donald Trump and uh, I find his actions unacceptable, a lot of people say, OK, great, so then vote for Joe Biden. And I've been hearing that enough for years that I, I thought it was time for me to respond and say that Joe Biden isn't just somebody I disagree with on certain issues. He is his actions, especially in his term as president, have gone far beyond anything that I would find acceptable uh, in a candidate. Even even if I were to cross party lines, I'm generally vote Republican. I would not vote for a Democrat who treats pro-lifers this way. Yeah, and as we mentioned, I uh, used Mark Houck as an example of a pro-lifer who was persecuted by the DOJ. We, I mean, we remember that story very well. What is at the root of the targeting of pro-lifers, do you think? And where do you see this going? So I, I think that's a great question, because the implicit argument that sometimes uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris make out loud and uh, often they make through their actions is that Opposing abortion isn't merely a political position they reject, but that it's outside the bounds of what is acceptable. That is, you know, you and I, we could we could debate tax rates, we could debate this, we would never debate whether slavery is okay, okay? Somebody was running for office saying slavery is okay, or if a voter is articulating that, that's not acceptable. So some things are no longer acceptable or never were. I think that Harris and Biden have made it clear that they consider the pro-life view 
to be unacceptable. It is akin to being, you know, believing in Jim Crow. It is racist. It's it's outside the bounds. And so that is why they feel fine, you know, not sticking up for the crisis pregnancy centers. Elizabeth Warren, Democratic senator, has said we need to shut them down. That is why when Trump says, oh, I'm not against all Republicans, just the, the you know, the MAGA extremists, and he includes in that any pro-lifer. And that is why they created what they call the Reproductive Rights Task Force at the Justice Department. And as far as we can tell, the purpose of that was to go after anybody they could plausibly charge with a violation of the FACE Act, the clinics, you know, fair access to clinics entrance. And so this is really a weaponizing the federal government against pro-lifers because they don't see them as legitimate. They don't see us as legitimate. And, and Tim, I mean, what do you think we can do? So, I mean, the, the key thing is, I think, as, as journalists, we need to keep shedding light on this. I think that uh, pro-lifers need to not back down, because a huge part of this is an effort to back down. You look at Mark Houck and how his life was turned upside down. He won the case, obviously. It was very clear that he was in the right, that the uh, the Planned Parenthood volunteer who uh, harassed him and then led to the altercation was in the wrong, that the Justice Department in prosecuting him was in the wrong. But it's not fun to have agents show up and arrest you and front of your family to have to go through that lawsuit. So part of the purpose of this is to intimidate us and uh, force us to stop taking action against abortion. And uh, the key thing now is to not let that work, to continue to stand up for the unborn and to continue to call out the uh, Biden Justice Department for its abuse of power. Tim, we have probably about a minute or so left. I'm curious, um, what else are you working on and what else maybe do you have your eye on? Well, so I think that we have a, a broader cultural problem here that's anti-family. Um, I'm finishing up a, a book now called Family Unfriendly to describe how America's culture is not in favor of family. That's one reason millennials are having so few babies, why right? we have a falling birth rate. And part of it is just sort of norms and customs about how much parents have to helicopter over their kids. But part of it, I really think, is a, a philosophical and spiritual problem that we don't see humans as good and that you don't think that we have an obligation obligation to help people raise kids. And so this, I really think, needs to be uh, turned around in America. It's shown by the fact that millennials say, no, it's too hard to raise kids. Yes, it's always been hard, but our culture makes it harder in all sorts of ways, politics, economics, but mostly just the norms, the expectations, and our understanding of what a human is and how valuable you are, even from the time that you're a little baby who doesn't, you know, doesn't contribute to the household, but that you're infinitely valuable at any stage. Absolutely. We're all blessings. Tim, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, on the margins, Pope Francis prays for the forgotten in his monthly prayer intention, plus analysis of daily life for the faithful in Mongolia. Pope Francis released his prayer intention for September, saying that he is asking the faithful to remember those who are living on the margins of society. Por favor, dejemos de hacer invisibles a los que están al margen de la sociedad. In a video released by the Vatican, the Holy Father urged the faithful not to neglect the homeless and to never be indifferent to those in need. Pope Francis concluded with a prayer that those living in subhuman conditions may not be neglected by institutions or others who are in a position to help. Well, finally tonight, as we mentioned earlier, Pope Francis is in Mongolia. The East Asian nation is the world's most sparsely populated sovereign countries, with one of the smallest Catholic communities on the globe, yet boasts a long history of religious freedom. A former Mongolian leader says religious freedom and respect for human life are fundamental values in his country. Takajin al-Bagdor first served as prime minister, then president of Mongolia from 2009 to 2017. We spoke with him earlier this year about freedom of worship and his impressions of the current and former popes. Well, Mr. President, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We're so honored. Yeah, you are welcome. Yeah. So much to talk about. But first, I want to talk about your country, Mongolia, and religious freedom. It has a long history of religious freedom in Mongolia. Um, I also know there's a diversity of faiths there, including Catholics. Can you talk to us about the wide array of faiths in Mongolia and why religious freedom is also very important to you? Throughout our history, 
Mongols were very respectful for religious beliefs. And you know that uh, actually Mongolians built the biggest land empire. And uh, one of the uh, distinctive features of that empire was very tolerant to their religious beliefs. During the Mongolian Empire, uh, all those people who actually worked in churches, temples, they were the exempted from military service, also from tax. And uh, that was something and to, to support that belief. And Genghis Khan said, if you are in the hearts, minds of people, that what, uh, people's body will follow you. And the foundation was, of course, to have that great respect. In 1990, we actually changed our country a lot, and we adopted new constitution. And in our constitution, that's the foundation of our, one of the foundations of our constitution is to, to be, we have to be respectful to beliefs. You do have some Catholics in the country, maybe albeit a small population. Um, and I also know, speaking of Catholics, that you met our beloved Pope Benedict a few years ago. Can you yes. tell us about that meeting? It happened in October 2011, and I visited Rome and Vatican, and uh, our meeting was very warm. I think I, I, I recall that was really one of the best meetings I had, and we talked about how our history and uh, our history also, including the religious history, and Pope actually very much interested. It seemed the uh, meeting with um, Pope Benedict yeah. really left a lasting impression on you. Yes. Um, your reflections on what you think may be his lasting legacy? I think his lasting legacy, of course, uh, his humanity and his love of humanity and his passion to serve in the best interest of humanity. And uh, that uh, we, we're going to learn a lot from him, I think, from his legacy, yeah. And you also met Pope Francis. Yes, what I, was that I met. Meeting like? Yeah, I met Pope Francis, uh, but in a different capacity. I'm the commissioner. Uh, there is an organization called the International Commission Against Death Penalty, and we know that Pope Francis have a great attitude towards the respecting and campaigning for life, and also campaigning against death penalty. We talked about how important to campaign for the uh, advocate the life and how important to abolish that penalty. Yeah. Why is that it's so important to you? You know, it was really important. I, I was uh, one of the young person who established non-governmental movement in Mongolia against communist regime, late 1980s. Actually, that coincided with the fall of Berlin Wall. And during that time, Soviet Union was intact. And that uh, Tiananmen massacre just happened. And because of that, I think that the religious freedom and also that uh, respect that human life, human dignity is, I think, fundamental thing we are still exercising in my country. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.